Southridge Ted Ed Student Talks. Yes, yes. This started as the brainchild of one of our second grade teachers, Kelly Hughes, who was inspired by um, someone that she knows who's a teacher in San Diego. She and her teaching partner, second grade teaching partner, Mackenzie Ketman, applied and, um, to TED, to the TED organization, for us to be a student talks club. We are the only one in the state of Washington, so I think that's a pretty important designation. So then what happened, once um, we were awarded the designation as a TED Ed organization, uh, we went out to our teachers and said, give us some names of students that you think could speak passionately about a topic. So if any of you have ever watched a TED Talk um, online, you understand that someone is passionate and seen as an expert on a topic and they present their thinking to an audience. So we wanted to be able to help students who could do that for themselves. So the students were nominated by their teachers and by staff, and the 12 students that you are going to hear from tonight were the students that were nominated and were willing to commit and spend their time outside of school to be ready for this big event tonight. They have been practicing on Thursdays, every Thursday after school. There has been so much support beyond the support of Kelly and Mackenzie um, from other from staff who sat and listened to students practice, who um, helped kids rehearse, so we, I think I have five teachers in the, in the back helping to wrangle the kids tonight. There's just been so much support from the teachers and staff at Southridge to make this possible. And so, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So with that, we're gonna get started. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Our first speaker tonight is Lion Geisel. Many of you may have kids like me who love football, really want to play, and dream of playing in the NFL. Some of you may have let your kids play youth football, and others, like my parents, will only let me play kicker. My dad reminds me that my friend's parents, my friend's dad, who played in the NFL, won't let his kids play at all due to the risk of head injuries. So I guess in about four years, me and my friend Easton, whose parents will only let him play kicker too, will be fighting with the few minutes of playtime kickers get in each game. I get it, anxious parents. I've seen the injuries. I remember watching an NFL game in which the quarterback snapped the ball and threw it to a receiver who was knocked off the screen before he caught the ball. He didn't move after hitting the ground. I asked my dad what happened, since he's a doctor, and he said it looked like a spinal cord injury, which I know changes your life and it will kill you. Attempting to prove my parents that this was not normal, I did some research and the results were disappointing. I discovered that 90% of NFL players have to retire because of their injuries. I got frustrated since this didn't prove my point, but I kept digging for information. Then I looked up NFL players that had to end their career because of their injuries. Here are some examples. Number one, in week two, 2001, Drew Bledsoe, a quarterback for the Patriots, was hit at the chest by Mo Lewis. He was bleeding from his rib cage inside his chest, and he said that he almost died. Number two, in week two, 2001, in week 14, 2019, Luke Kinkley, a linebacker for the Carolina Panthers, but suffered a concussion against the New Orleans Saints. After he found out that he wasn't as fast or as physical anymore, he announced his retirement at only age 29. I got frustrated since this didn't prove my point at all. <laughs> but here's the thing, I love football and I really want to play. We must be able to solve this. Kids like me really need football to be a safer sport so we can play and not get injuries. 
High low pinpoint and learn that it is impossible to engineer equipment that can prevent every in every concussion and every broken bone. But there are some cool new technologies that may soon make football safer, only if we can implement them in youth programs. Number one, mobile virtual players have developed crash test dummies to test gear in their lifelike conditions to ensure the gear works as designed. Number two, such a helmet can be developed that crumple on impact absorbing shocks and preventing concussions. Number three, ultra thin helmet liners are in development that reduce sheer forces on players' heads. Number four, concussion detection technology has been more aware to include concussion goggles to act on the objective of marking concussions, blood testing to detect a concussion at 20 minutes from the injury, and helmet sensors. Number five, Scientists have developed small and safer shoulder pads to be small and safer than the traditional shoulder pads. Well, well, the challenge with these new technologies is that they may be too expensive. And good news, some develop coaching de developments are entirely coaching related and don't require teams to buy equipment. These are things we can do today. Number one, there's been more awareness in head trauma, of head trauma in recent years. And I hope coaches don't put injured players back in the game until they heal. Number two, there's been changes to the rules to reduce unnecessary roughness, such as helmet to helmet contact and tackling a player after the play. Number three, at the college level, teams are studying helmet loose and padless practices to see if the increase in body awareness that comes with not having protective gear helps players move in more self protective ways, thus, training and safe movement. Number four, coaches are learning to rest the players since overtired players are more likely to hurt themselves. All my research did not, unfortunately, result in a great argument that football is safe in the way it is currently practiced. I do hope that between safer football gear and more effective injury prevention coaching, football can become a safer sport in the future. What I hope you will do as a parent is to advocate for the safest football gear possible with this as well as the best coaching practices with safety as a first priority. Thank you for watching. Bye. We have 11 more of those that are just as impressive. Wait, nice job, Ryan. Okay, our next speaker is Haley Cole. Close your eyes and imagine what a ballerina looks like. Did you picture a dainty ballerina moving sweetly across the stage? I want you to know ballet is not as fashionable as it looks. Ballet helps in many ways and can have a positive effect on children's cognitive development. Ballet is also not a form. Well, so you might argue that ballet is a sport instead. Do you know what I'd answer? I'd say you're completely wrong. Ballet is not a joint, I'd say. I'd say you're right. Well, it's not a joint, it's not a form. An art form is a conventionally established form of artistic composure such as a novel, painting, or sculpture. Oxford Dictionary defines art form as an act regarded as a medium of imaginative or creative self expression. I was in a nutcracker place. Once before COVID and once last fall. The first time I was in a nutcracker, I was an and an angel. The second time, I was an mouse and a party girl. I had two months to learn two different parts. It was very hard work, and I had to memorize so many things. In one part, as a party girl, it always changed. When we were watching the dancing dolls, we always had to move around and watch with awe to make a little kick. we never seen it before. But in reality, during practice, we saw them perform over and over again. It was hard to make a look if we never seen the dancing dolls before. So it wasn't just ballet, it was with Becky too. We need to express what we're feeling without words. We had to use facial expressions and lots of body language to copy our films. My first year in a nutcracker, I performed three times in one weekend. The second time, I performed two times in one day. Both times, I wish I could do it all over again, but I knew I couldn't, for my legs and my arms would be super sore the next day. Now it's Playing how long makes you stronger. Every stretch you do, every jump, every movement makes you stronger. It's been proven by, that if you're in ballet for a very long time, you'll be 25% stronger than you were when you started. 
I'll also explain how Malay makes you more flexible. Your muscles will stretch and come longer, and your muscles are less likely to get strain. Football players out there, make sure to listen to this part. Ballet helps you be faster. How, you ask? Well, if you don't want to join ballet class, you can do at the bare minimum plies and leaps. When you do plies and leaps, you stretch the tendons of your legs. Here, if you don't do a ballet class, then we'll have the same as an effect on you. Ballet helps football players avoid tackles by having good balance and agility. Ballet helps football players throw footballs, catch football players, catch footballs by having, by having good focus. Now you see how ballet improves your cognitive function, flexibility, and agility. True ballet's art it is whimsical and enchanting, but it is very hard work. You are not anything fragile. We are strong, self-controlled, and a challenging. Thank you. Can we turn the kids' mics up just a touch? It doesn't, it sound, I think all of you need to hear more clearly, I think. Just a touch on the kids' mics, thank you. Okay, our next student speaker is Izzy Reddick. Izzy, come on up. And I said, Mom, what happened? She told me about the large butterfly that got out through the gorge. Then this year, in second grade, I learned about the pikers and how the wildfires affected them. Have you ever heard about an animal called a pika? This is a pika. <laughs> Pikas are small, round animals with Brown and black fur to camouflage into rocks. They kind of look like rabbits, but as potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> These two little mammals live in the mountains here in the Pacific Northwest. I guess it grooms my grasses and flowers. What if Harvey is important in makes an ecosystem and the news? I guess that the grass and the hay parts need to be water. Sometimes these hay parts seek a parts which creates a nutrient source for plants. Also, when packers dig for the home, they increase soil pollution, plant types, and water go to the door. Packers allow snow covered moss to survive. This unique habitat was damaged, was damaged by the moon in the group of 2017, causing many pikas to die. You might be asking, how can we protect the pika? My answer is to leave no trace. That means you want to go to the habitat, be respectful, and live it the way inside. In conclusion, the scientific name for pika is princeps, which means chief Latin, because the native people can call them no chief yes. I think you said we should treat pikers with respect and name of life. Thank you. I am really lucky that I get to spend all day every day at work with these incredible kiddos. It is pretty much the best job ever. All right, next up, Miss Peyton Lampy. Hello, my name is Peyton Lamping. In the summer of 2021, I tragically lost my worst problem to colic, which is a condition horses can develop with little to no warning. I was already having a hard year in second grade due to COVID-19. I felt very lost until one, until one day I started to reconnect with my mom's first chocolate and struggle with baby Nikki. Over the last year and a half, I realized how important animals were in my own healing process. 
Did you know animals feel grief too? There's another TED talk about grief. However, it was about how animals feel grief too. It was about an orca that lost its baby and carried it a thousand miles on its back before the land slip off. I believe animals can help you through your own grief because they feel grief too. Mickey was only three months old when Sparkles died and needed me as much as I needed him, knowing that he was tuned to St. Sparkles, but it is even tighter together. Also, I feel closer to Sparkles' memory whenever I hang out with him. Taco is very important during my own healing process because when I hang out with her, I feel calm and relaxed. Some days I just lay on her and read. I love her so much. One day, my grandma gave me an article about health and science. It said that people who experience very high pain levels report a lower pain levels when they have pet come in for a visit. All my animals were very important during the pandemic and through, this period, and through my period of grief. I cannot imagine my life without them. I'm guessing you're wondering how I can help. You can help by supporting yourself and others through times of grief by spending time with animals and also supporting organizations that support therapy animals. It's also a great way for more people to experience the amazing benefits of animal companionship. Thank you. Goodbye.
is ADH. D is, I found out that ADHD isn't a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. Having ADHD can help you be more creative, making more, give you better intuition, make you more resilient, and make you have more energy. When it's someone, another great superpower is hyperfocus. Hypofocus is the ability to focus on one task and tune out everything else. When someone is hypofocused, they focus on one specific task and tune out everything else. Which is kind of the opposite of what everyone thinks ADHD is. It's like a ninja superpower. a lot of people be more successful. Like Michael Phelps, the Olympic swimmer, and Simon Biles, the Olympics gymnastic team. Both have ADHD and I love to swim and do tricks. Karina Swimmer, the famous professional dancer, also has ADHD and I love to dance. There are also other people at my school who have told me they have ADHD. I'm not really alone. I'm in great company. I've come a long way from the brain jumping around top, and I thought my brain was really jumping around. So when I got, so when I finally asked my mom, and when she said no, I was in huge relief. I hope that if you have ADHD, you now feel you now feel like you aren't alone, and you feel part of the superpowers you maybe or maybe didn't know you had. Thanks for coming. Bye. Pretty impressive. All right, our next student speaker is Kai Robinson. Activates the brain like playing an instrument. When we, 
When we play an instrument, we're using nearly every area of our brain at once. The left side, which handles academics, and the right side, which handles emotions and creativity. Those neurons that were creating sparks are now having a full-blown party, creating all kinds of connections. Those connections cross over through a thing called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is like a gateway between the left and right side of your brain. From research, we know that musicians have a larger corpus callosum because of the amount of music that they play. The size of your corpus callosum has a direct effect on a thing called executive function. Executive function is a set of mental skills that we all have. It allows you to work, organ it allows you to organize, prioritize, and activate your work, monitor and self-regulate your actions, utilize working memory and short-term short -term recall, manage frustrations and modulate emotions, regulate alertness, sustain effort and speed. It also allows you to focus, sustain, and the ability to shift task attention. These skills help us in all aspects of life and are sharpened when we play an instrument. When we play, if you want these effects that when you play an instrument, you need to do a few things. First, you need to be active. Be an active participant. Just listening to or learning about music does not have the same effects that playing music does. Second, you need to start young. The younger you are when you start, the more your brain has the ability to grow and develop. But no matter what age you start, you can still experience these effects. Finally, you need to stick with it. If you take lessons and will stop, the effects that you gain may go away. Music can help us, music can help people who are struggling. It helps speech processing in kids with dyslexia. It helps rewire parts of the brain that are underdeveloped because of malnourishment. It lowers the feelings of stress, depression, and anxiety. It prevents dementia in adults. And it does so much more. In my opinion, music classes in schools kids should be given kids should be given a wider variety of instruments to choose from, and they should start at a younger age. In my opinion, kindergarten. I think if someone is having a hard time in school, music could be the answer. Music is a medicine. Music is a medicine with the power to heal, and I hope you learned something new about it today. Nice job, Kai. All right, our next student speaker is Miss Addie Green. from MRSA after having spinal surgery. He spends most of his time watching most movies, sneaking sweet treats, and flipping. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think of how long he is. But when me and my sister visit him, a light turns on. His eyes light up, and he talks for hours. Sometimes he tells the same story over and over. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't matter. We just love visiting him because it brings us joy. I think people, specifically kids, they spend more time socializing with these elderly, because both seniors and kids with benefits. These you can see as benefit seniors. Some have no visitors for days, weeks, and even months. This can mean that they're not active and could have issues with walking, back pain, and lots of other things. But kids can benefit from visiting them too. For example, it 
to Alexander was a pilot in the early years. The kids will learn more about being a pilot, both the elderly and the kids can enjoy this visit. <laughs> my older sister's fourth grade class went and visited her care facility. This got my sister very excited. She would write notes to her elderly friends and build a strong friendship with the elderly. The people in the care facility love the fourth graders in this. My, but helping the elderly helps all kinds of people. For example, my cousin works at a care facility themselves. They have a mental health illness, but helping the elderly makes them feel important and helps them care for themselves too. You may think that none of this is important, but if you do think that way, did you know that 40% of the seniors are lonely right now? You might want to know how to help. You can take your child or maybe your parent to an elderly home. While you're there, you can greet an elderly and make new friendships. It'll be fun for everyone. Thank you for listening to my TED Talk. Our next student speaker is David Conway. Tuesday, April 14, 2021 is the day I will never forget. I was only nine years old when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and had my first son son shot. I also learned it wouldn't be my last one either. I will never forget that day because that is the day where my health changed, changed permanently. Here is how it all began. My mom woke me up at 5 in the morning and told me we had to go to the hospital. I was scared and didn't know what to do. You see, I had my blood drawn two days before and my glucose levels came back really high. For a non-diabetic person, glucose levels or the sugar in your blood should be no higher than 120. When I got my blood drawn, my glucose level was 451. Now you see why my, why my mom had to abruptly wake me up at 5 in the morning and take me to the hospital. She drove me all the way to Portland. We went to Randall's Children's Hospital's emergency room. They put us in a room and got us settled in. Since I didn't eat breakfast, I ordered a bagel and cream cheese. A doctor named Dr. Radica came in and explained juvenile type 1 diabetes to us. She was very nice and made us feel comfortable. She even said we could go back home and stay a couple of nights instead of staying at the hospital for a couple of nights. We just had to go to the diabetes office to be educated first. At the diabetes office, they gave us a binder of what to do when your glucose levels aren't in a safe range. This is a lot of information for a nine-year-old to take in, and I was feeling nervous and in total disbelief. Type 1 diabetes isn't like asthma or ADHD. It's a little different, but still common. Think of it as a bus driver driving the kids to school. The kids are the sugar and the bus driver is... No. The kids are the sugar and the bus driver is insulin. If you don't have the bus driver, your body starts to have high blood sugar or ketones, which you can have a risk of having ketones or ketoacidosis. By having ketoacidosis, you might have to go to the hospital. I take insulin shots before all meals and bedtime to prevent this from happening. Here's how it all to prevent this from happening. Living with type 1 diabetes isn't that bad. I may have to take insul insulin shots or get my blood drawn frequently, but everyone is different in their own way. When I was new to Ridge, I, would, I was new to Ridgefield when I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I didn't have any friends because I was new to Ridgefield and not attend school yet because of the pandemic. I felt worried that people would think that type 1 diabetes would be contagious.
Okay, you get the general idea, but what should we do? Raise awareness about the early signs and symptoms of juvenile type 1 diabetes. Before I was diagnosed, I was eating a lot of food and drinking a lot of water. My mom thought I was having a growth spurt. But after a couple of weeks of going to the bathroom quite a bit, she knew something wasn't right. Type 1 diabetes is a serious medical condition, and if left untreated, you can get a risk of getting ketones, like I said before. Here are a few ideas. Number one, I think a guardian or a school nurse should have glucose tests, basically really big smarties, or juice available for kids with low blood sugar to prevent them from going low. Number two, I think that recess teachers or camp leaders should be aware of who has type 1 diabetes so they can put, they can keep their glucose levels in the same range. After all I told you, believe it or not, I become a different person and I know the challenges people can face. Thank you.
A study from the University of Wisconsin published in 2022 explains how shark antibodies are so similar to human antibodies that a human immune system may not even recognize it as foreign in attack. This allows researchers to use sharks to create potential cures and treatments for coronavirus, cancer, and other deadly diseases. Sharks may be unlikely heroes, but they are heroes nonetheless. So the next time someone tells you they are afraid of sharks, take a moment to tell them why sharks are so important. Not just Jaws, folks, not just Jaws. All right, our next student speaker is Ella Ferdisali. Hi, my name is Ella. I want to talk to you about COVID. Last year, in the middle of the summer, my entire immediate family got COVID. I was lucky and I didn't have anything. Because I had COVID, I had to miss out on a lot of fun things. You can get really, really sick and have to go to the hospital. Some people can die from COVID. My dad, grandma, and all doctors. My mom is a practitioner. My dad has had to wear a very thick mask that's hard to breathe through. They can get sick very easily because they're in a busy hospital. They have to work long hours. Sometimes the entire night. My mom and dad worry because they don't want my sister and I to get COVID because my granddaughter has COVID because she has asthma. If you don't want to have COVID, then you should consider getting the COVID vaccine. COVID has known better since the vaccine came out in 2021. Less people have gotten sick because of it, and we don't have to worry about it everywhere anymore because of it. In 1796, Edward Jenner performed the first smallpox vaccination. Since this time, how vaccines are made has changed, but the ideas remain the same. But the body sticks to the virus is used to tell the body the virus. This creates antibodies. These antibodies provide protection in the future if the body encounters the same virus. We get vaccines for different reasons. Chimps get the pneumococcal vaccine to protect their grandparents. Women grandbabies and their families get the pertussis vaccine to protect the new baby when he is born. Vaccines don't just help ourselves, they can help other people too. How many people have benefited from vaccines? Every year, two to three million people are saved by vaccines. So in conclusion, vaccines have helped us and they continue to help us live healthier and longer lives. Sometimes we do things to show others who care about them. Vaccines can be a way to show others who care about them. Thank you for listening to my talk. All right, we are on our last student speaker of the evening. We are finishing tonight with Easton Quast. Have you ever wondered what your best life would be? And if you have, why are you living it? An author named Glennon Doyle wrote a book called Unstained. My mom was reading this book one day, and in a chapter, it talked about the concept of a most beautiful life story. She later asked me what my most beautiful life would be. I couldn't think of what it was at first, but then I had. Back then, I wanted to live in a little treehouse community with my friends and family. Animals are a big part of my life, and I wanted to be able to help them. In that version of my most beautiful life story, I would go out every day and help animals. But lately, I've been thinking about living on a farm. That's okay. It's okay to change your most beautiful life story. Don't worry, I still have that animals. <laughs> you make decisions every day whether we realize it or not, that it was towards or away from living our most beautiful life story. We make small decisions like what food should I eat or where should I go today? We 
who made a big decision to grow a most beautiful life story in every man too, like me, started a garden to help me learn more about farming. Not many adults can imagine the most beautiful life story right away. In fact, I didn't deserve it. I found out that only 32 of the 31 adults that I served can imagine their most beautiful life story in great detail. Why is this important? Because like Gloria Steinem said, dreaming, after all, is a form of pain. According to the Global Happiness Study, made in 2019, Two-thirds of adults globally, 64% reported being happy. 14% very much so, and 50% rather so. Countries with the highest proportion of adults considering themselves as very happy are Canada, 29%, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and India, 28%, Great Britain, and the United States, 27%. We need to know that our most beautiful life stories. We need to know that our most beautiful life stories because happiness lowers the risk for cardiovascular disease, lowers your blood pressure, enables better sleep, improves your diet, and also adds several years to life expectancy. Here's another thing about happiness. If you're happy, the kids are around are happy. And if those kids are happy, those kids are going to be happy adults. Happy adults take care of their neighbors. They give to those in need, and I'm pretty sure they don't start wars. <laughs> <laughs> it can be hard to achieve the goals you need to live your most beautiful life story. That doesn't mean you should quit them. Ask for help. Ask a trusted adult to help you achieve the goals you need. So in the words of Glenn and Dole, let's conjure up from the depths of our souls the truest, most beautiful lives we can imagine. Let's all start living our most beautiful life story. recognize all of our speakers tonight. So if all of our student speakers could come on out to the stage, please. Since January, every Thursday, with each other, I know I heard all kinds of stories about the practicing that they were doing at home. I also know that our staff at school were helping them practice during class when they had a few minutes, reading scripts, doing all kinds of things to make sure that they were all ready to go tonight. And we are so incredibly proud of what you have done and what you've accomplished. Nice job, everybody. Let's do one more round.
and to all the staff at Southbridge who made this possible. There's fun photo booth opportunity out in the lobby with lots of props and things so, um, to commemorate the evening. There's also snacks and things that the PTA is offering, so if you're the park chef or all of that, um, please stop there. Thank you so much for coming and supporting our kids. This was an awesome night. Thank you so much. <laughs>